in this first year of, of being part of a consortial model for online tutoring. So um, session today, I, I'll give you a little bit of background about Miracosta. Uh, I think it's really important to understand some things about the characteristics of different institutions when we talk about different distance ed solutions. And I'm certainly not one to say that because this seems to be working for us, it's going to work for you. So just to, to let you know a little bit about the characteristics that, that have helped it to be something that's, that seems to be working for us. Um, then some general discussion about online tutoring. That I definitely want to hear from you all what your interest is and what your experiences have been personally and, and at your institutions. Um, then I'll get much more into some specifics of the model that we've started using, show you some, a lot of screenshots of what the, uh, the e-tutoring platform looks like and talk about how the consortium works and talk about how we actually decided to go with it and some of the process of implementing it. Um, and then I have at the end a lot of different data from this first year ranging from just usage data, what kinds of things our students like about it, what, what subjects seem really uh, useful and some first-hand sort of um, more in-depth feedback from students and our tutors as well. So just a little bit about Miracosta. If you haven't heard of Miracosta, it's in North Coastal, San Diego County. Um, so we're right there in that coastal strip that's kind of beige. Um, one of the nice things about being located there is it's a pretty affluent area. And so we're one of just a handful of basic aid districts in the state. That means we get sufficient property tax funding that we're not dependent on state budgets. Um, so we, we have a lot of resources at hand um, and kind of a history of being able to sort of get what we need, get what we want to serve students. Um, this is one of the newer buildings on campus. We're actually um, way overdue to have a bond and pass that bond. It, we tried the bond this fall and it failed. So as, as a campus, we're actually kind of constricted. This building is the library information hub that was built about 10 years ago. And on the first floor of this building are the three primary tutoring centers on campus. So they were well integrated within the library. And my office is up on the second floor, Office of Online Education. Um, so it's kind of a nice central spot, and I have a good working relationship with the tutoring center directors there. Um, a little bit of background about online education at Miracosta. It goes way back to the mid-90s. Uh, it grew relatively slowly, but um, through the 2000s, it's very much taken off to where you can see at the lower right that every semester we're offering about 200 completely online sections of courses and another 100 or so hybrid sections. So we have a lot of online education going on. Um, our first sub change proposal was in 2009, and we threw a lot of courses into that. I'm working on one right now to do about another 30 programs that are available, at least 50% or more online. But we still don't really advertise any fully online programs. So that's not been our emphasis at all. We've just grown very organically over the years. I was hired in 2011, and it was a new position that was created. This, um, uh, faculty director of online ed, recognizing that there, for the size of the program that we had, we didn't necessarily have a lot of policy and a lot of um, kind of procedures and systematizing in place of, of distance ed. Um, so it gave me time over the last year or so to get to know the college to assess what our strengths and weaknesses were. And one of the first things I realized um, was that we really lacked any kind of online tutoring at all. and looking for kind of small wins that didn't require huge political battles to figure out how to do, that seemed to me as one area that, that could potentially uh, be something that I could help um, make happen right away. Again, just one more little bit of data about Miracosta course enrollments. You can see the yellow is uh, non-DE, the blue is DE, so this is just individual course enrollments over time. So. Uh, even in the late 2000s, when a lot of people's budgets were declining, we were able to grow our overall course enrollments. And, and the DE course enrollments have steadily grown from 6 point something percent back in the early 2000s to over 20 percent of all of our course enrollments at this point are DE course enrollments. But again, without really trying to target fully online learners and fully distance programs, it's just a convenient part of education for a lot of our students. Uh, sorry, that thing got flipped sideways. Uh, that was a, this is an org chart um, and not intended to show you the entire thing, but just to show you where I sit in the org chart. So 
Um, I report to the Dean of Academic Information Services, who reports to the Vice President for Instruction. The Dean of AIS oversees the library and all technology, so instructional technology, business technology, everything. So that actually works out pretty well for me in online education. I have direct relationships with people that manage the servers, that manage classroom technology. The library resource folks are all people that I have really good working relationships with and have great access to. I just have one direct report who is the person that is primarily responsible for working with faculty on the support of Blackboard and other online technologies. Um, so it, it's, it works really well, I think, for me and, and for the organization to have me there. This is just a picture of our tutoring area in the library on that first floor. Um, our writing center is kind of back to the back. This area right here is called our Tutoring and Academic Support Center, which does supplemental instruction and one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring for most of our subjects. And then if you were able to turn around and look the other way, you'd be looking at the Math Learning Center, which is run by our math department and obviously is really focused on math. Um, there's a lot of interesting political history in our tutoring centers. I don't know how many of you, I'll, I'll ask you in a minute, how many of you are, have direct connections with tutoring centers. But it seems to me not uncommon that when you have multiple tutoring centers, the relationships are not always harmonious. And the, the direct reports of our different tutoring center directors have changed over the years. Um, so they all kind of report in different directions. And it's, there, there hasn't necessarily been a, a strong sense of, of shared um, purpose, even though they're all in one place. So that was part of my political challenge in trying to get online tutoring going. Let's go back up for a minute and talk a little bit more. So, um, hello, welcome. Good, thank you. Oh, by the way, there is a one-page handout up here in the corner with a few URLs and a few sort of guiding questions if you're interested in having that. Um, So just a quick reset for the people that are walking in. No problem for being late. I know that, that um, lunch is, was late and all, but I'm Jim Julius, faculty director of online ed at Miracosta. I've just done a little bit of background about Miracosta itself as an institution and, um, and some of the tutoring background of what's gone on at Miracosta. And just the, one final catch-up piece. We have three primary tutoring centers that are co-located in the library, a writing center, a general tutoring and academic support center, and a math learning center. And what I was just saying is, as, as we kind of reset there, the, the tutoring center directors have a working relationship, but they're not necessarily always on the same page with each other. And for me, um, coming into the situation, uh, the tutoring and academic support center director was the one who really reached out to me and said, look, we've been trying for years to figure out this online tutoring thing. Can you help us figure it out in some way? And so he was the person that I had a real primary relationship with. Yes? Within the library. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep, and they're all like me, a faculty director. So they're full-time faculty who are um, on, you know, non-classroom faculty. That's their full position is, is running those centers. Miracles has a lot of faculty director positions, which is kind of unusual, I guess, for community colleges. We don't have a lot of associate deans. In fact, I think there's only one or two associate deans at all. Rather, we have faculty directors that, that are in a lot of those kinds of positions. Um, so. As I started working with the, the task, the Tutoring and Academic Support Center director, and brainstorming and hearing from him about past attempts to, um, to offer online tutoring, um, I, I did talk to the other directors, but not as much as I probably should have. Anyway, this is kind of leaping ahead a bit, but this is a, a web page that I created in the process to try to create sort of a, a unified landing place, because there was nothing like this that spoke to students about the range of academic support services at Miracosta. And so just to zoom in a little bit on that, what this provided then for students who were just sort of searching for tutoring at Miracosta is the link to the online tutoring that we eventually 
decided upon, as well as links to the individual websites and just brief information about those three centers. Again, that was something new because those centers didn't necessarily always cooperate. They each had their own web presence, but not sort of a centralized presence. So that was one thing that doing online tutoring had this kind of nice side effect of providing this little bit of unification. And there is a website uh, on this um, handout that you have for this page if you, if you should want to look at that. Um, so why online tutoring? I just want to hear for a minute from you all. What are some of the reasons that you're here at this presentation? What, what interests you about online tutoring? What motivates you to be here? So that's a, that's a good segue. Let me um, keep moving. So I, I think one of the other things that didn't necessarily come up here but is a good question for you to consider as you're thinking about online tutoring at your institution, is it because you need to have tutoring for your online students or is it just a, another way, a better way or an additional way of serving all of your students with tutoring? So that, I think that's a key driver in thinking about that. Um, but then that accreditation expectation is really big, of course, that, that online tutoring I think is one of the key areas that if you can show that you're doing that, it's going to make the ACCJC pretty happy. Um, so just to talk for a minute about the kind of the typical online tutoring models, and I think the two that most people think about are either outsourcing or trying to sort of build it yourself in-house. And for me, in reflecting and talking with our tutoring center directors about these options, he had tried both. There had been exper experiments back five, six years ago with both of these, and both were problematic. The outsourcing, yeah, it's great because it's easy. You just sort of sign up and it's there. And then it's very available. Lots of subjects, lots of time, very available. But it can be real expensive. And 
there can be questions about whether it's consistent in the way that they do that with your local tutoring philosophy. Um, you know, and, and what our experience at Miracosta had been was a lot of money was paid, but it was very underutilized. So if you have a sense that it's going to take a while to kind of get the institution to come around to online tutoring, if, the, if it's being primarily driven not because you have faculty who are saying, my students need online tutors, let's get it there, but more like we just have to do it because the, the accreditors are expecting that, don't know if anyone's going to show up for it, we've got to figure out how to market it once it's here. Buying into a service like Smart Thinking and then having nobody use it can be a big discouragement. On the other hand, if you build it in-house, um, it can be very continuous with your own tutoring philosophies, maybe less expensive because you're probably offering fewer hours, um, but the startup challenges can be really significant to figure out the technology, figure out the whole coordination and all of that, and then your availability to students is probably going to be pretty limited because you can't just sort of staff that all the time. Um, any other thoughts on those two kind of choices and pros, cons, things that you've experienced or looked at um, that you would add to that discussion? Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Correct. Yes. I think you're right. I think the tools, the availability of tools that are sophisticated enough to really run this have become much less of a barrier. I, I completely agree with you about that. Um, and within the California Community College System, we have CCC Confer, which is a great platform for, for online synchronous tutoring. So that's kind of just there for all of us. So the third way is a consortial model. So um, by what I mean by a consortial model, this was started actually in Connecticut. The Connecticut Distance Learning Consortium many years ago uh, started this online tutoring model that provides uh, for a, a platform and it provides for a coordination service with tutors that are provided by the member institutions. And, and it, it worked very well. It thrived. They made their platform available to other institutions and to other consortia. Um, and I learned about a consortium that w was called the Northwest E-Tutoring Consortium. The, it's really run out of the state of Washington and the State Board for Community and Technical College Education um, up in Washington makes it available to all community colleges in the state of Washington. But it's also open to other institutions around the West. And so the, the, the great things about that is it's relatively easy to implement because it's all sort of run separately and coordinated separately. There's very little that you have to do at your end. Um, the availability is pretty good. It's not 24-7, but it's seven days a week with lots of subjects. It's not unlimited subjects, but it's pretty good. And the cost is relatively low compared to running your own system, paying, paying people to try to staff something that might get very little use, or to, to, out think, to outsourcing to a third party. Um, again, consistency with local tutoring might be a little bit of an issue, but I think that's always going to be a question unless you completely roll your own. So now I'm going to get to the screenshot portion of the presentation just to show you a little bit of what e-tutoring, the, the platform itself, looks like. Yeah. Well, so this particular consortium is, is kind of independent, but it really is primarily driven by the Washington State Board for Community College and Technical, Technical Colleges. So there's also a consortium that uses the e-tutoring platform that's in Ohio that I don't think is community college driven. But, um, so there are the majority of members of this consortium are community colleges, but there are also four-year universities that are involved. Washington State University is a heavy user of it. There are several four-year institutions in Utah. The only other California institution right now is um, CSU East Bay. They are also a member of this consortium. So etutoring.org is, this is what it looks like. Um, 
there's a login button, but it's just kind of a general website that tells you about what they do. Um, once you log in, uh, or, or once you go to your institutional login page, you can see you have your own branding, and as an institution, you, you control what the text is here. So that's part of the setup process. Um, you can see what the subjects are that are available here. Um, probably the subjects that are most in demand at your institution for tutoring, but it's not an exhaustive list of all possible subjects by any means. But as a consortium, we decide what subjects are here. So if your institution, if you have faculty that really want to see a subject and it's not on that list, you can propose it to the consortium. If there are other institutions that are also interested, then it's just a matter of finding the tutors that are able to tutor that. And if, you can, and if somebody in the consortium says, I've got somebody that can tutor that for a few hours a week, they can just add that in. So that's, again, part of the power of the consortium is that you're part of the governance and the, de the decision making behind what the, what the uh, ins consortium actually offers in terms of subjects. Yes? <laughs> yes, so um, I do need to kind of spin that yarn for a little bit. Um, so you notice down here at the bottom about writing. No, Miracosta is working to develop its own online writing tutoring. So I mentioned briefly earlier that um, we have the three different, for those of you that came in a little late, we have three different primary tutoring centers on campus that aren't necessarily all buddy-buddy. Um, I work mostly with the Tutoring and Academic Support Center, which is the general tutoring, but we also have a writing center and a math learning center. Um, I probably went too far in the process before involving all of those folks. I, I was working mostly with the task director, and he was very enthusiastic about this. And when I went to the other directors and said, look what we're doing, isn't this neat? We're, we're going to provide online tutoring and um, hope, you, hope you like it. I kind of realized that the writing center folks are very particular, and probably that's true at most institutions, but writing center directors are very particular about their methodology and how they provide feedback to students, what their um, approach is, you know, what they think is best in terms of how you structure your appointments and how you give feedback and all of that kind of thing. And our writing center, in fact, has actually been for a while working toward offering their own online tutoring. Um, they had a process that they've been developing, and, and, and when they took a close look, and I'm going to show you a couple of screenshots in a minute, of what the Writing Center pedagogy is for their online writing, they were not thrilled about it. They didn't think it was as bad as some other things they've seen, but just not thrilled about it. So we chose to kind of downplay that, not make that a big part of what we we're pushing, um, knowing that our Writing Center was working towards offering their own, and they actually will starting this fall have a full, they piloted the spring, it went pretty well, and they'll have a full-on service this fall. And I've been working closely with them to help them get their processes up and running as well. Um, so that will just be complimentary. We don't lock people out. There is actually no way that you can lock our students out of Writing Center. And again, this is part of what I will touch on at the end, but part of what I want to do is get better at figuring out there may be certain types of students or certain situations where we will want to point them to this writing center. So we almost need kind of like an entry point to help students make decisions. What kinds of questions do you have? What's your turnaround right now for the need that you have? And if, you know, if it's this and this, you might want to go do the online writing center. But if it's this and this, you should really make an appointment and come in and see somebody in the writing center on campus. And of course, if you have fully distant students, this will always be the best choice for them because they don't want to come to campus. But we don't have very many students that are fully distant students. They're mostly local. They just take a few online courses out of convenience. Yeah. So we, we do have faculty that keep saying, computer science, can we please have tutoring for that? Um, their um, kinesiology is another one that our faculty have requested. Um, there's a third one that skips my mind at the moment. But the demand right now is coming from faculty and so not from students. So those are things I've put forward but haven't had the support from other consortium members to say, let's get it going. Right. Yeah, we could do more. We could do more with that, and we'll talk about the kinds of feedback that we get from students. So the, the consortium publishes a weekly schedule of all the synchronous tutoring that's available. And I know it's probably hard to see all the details, but it's just by week, by subject, 
and it actually has the name of each individual tutor and what time they'll be available. So some students that really like the synchronous tutoring may develop sort of relationships with particular synchronous tutors they like, and, um, and so they'll really look for those tutors. Others are just like, I need help now. Is it available? And they'll, they'll figure it out. So you can see that on the weekends, there's a little bit less tutoring in some areas, but in, even the, the math coverage is from 6.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturday. Math is definitely the highest demand. I'll show you some data on that in a minute. Um, and everything else is not like huge availability, but there's a little bit every day. So if you have a need, you can find it and, and get it. No, no, it's available to everybody. It's, it's completely available to all students. Yep. They don't. Um, in fact, they just there isn't really an appointment scheduling process. They just go in. And so here's what you. This actually leads to your question, Howard. So once you log in from that login page, this is the next screen that you would see, kind of the student homepage. So right at the top, it tells you the writing lab response time. So if they are looking to submit a paper through the e-writing lab, they'll have an idea what the turnaround time is. The other two services are e-chat, which is the synchronous, and e-questions, which is an asynchronous. Just I want to submit a question. I don't have to have it answered right now. I'll wait for a response. And in this e-chat area, it tells you, again, which tutor, which subjects, and how many students are in the room at the moment. So if there's multiple students in a room with a tutor that you wanted to speak to, you would just have to kind of queue up and wait for them. But you're welcome to go in the room and try to eavesdrop on what's being said. If, um, but you, you can't really set a time to, to come in and have a, a set appointment. Yes? Um, they are kept and they are available to the students that were in that session. So the student can log back in later and find those archives and replay them. Yeah, I don't think they're available to, yeah. It, 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 so it keeps track of who was in there. And then when you log back in later, you can see it. And the, the consortium also does quality assurance. So they will evaluate synchronous tutors by reviewing kind of randomly selected archives as well. Um, I Yes, I believe that when you do the e-questions that it does do a little bit of pattern matching when you submit the question to, sub to give you possible answers. I'm not certain about that, though. That's a good question. I think that's, that's there. Right. 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 That's a great question. I'm, I'm not certain. I think it does, but I'm not sure. Right, so that's a perfect segue. So I'm going to visit each of these services just so, again, screenshotting, you can see kind of what it looks like. So the first one here is eChat. So the eChat service in eTutoring uses the Adobe Connect platform, which is a lot like CCC Confer. And so this is where you could have live audio conversations. You can use the whiteboards. And as uh, all the tutors are trained to use audio, to ask that their students use audio, because a lot of times students go in and they're reluctant to use audio. So the tutors are encouraged to ask them to do that so you don't just text chat. Um, and then as an institution, you provide your tutors that are participating in the consortium with a tablet so that they with a graphics tablet, a Wacom tablet, so that they can use this um, whiteboard just to write really efficiently and not have to kind of try to use a mouse to draw things out or write things. So that's the that's the eChat um, platform. And yes, those sessions are recorded, as we mentioned. And on the back end of, of eTutoring, there is a fair bit of data that I can go in as an, as an administrator and review. Um, it's, not, it, it, it's a lot, but it's, it could be better. So on the back end, I can look at how many eChat sessions have gone on. It will show me my students' names, which tutors, how long they, those sessions lasted. By the way, if the session's less than 10 minutes, it doesn't really get recorded or count against your institutional usage. Um, 
the, the one thing that it doesn't tell you here that's kind of disappointing is which, what the subject was. So it's hard to, to look at, um, you know, which subjects are most popular for eChat. Uh, and that's something that the consortium knows would be nice to, to try to figure out how to include. Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is pull, drill down into e-questions. So in the e-questions, you get a big form that looks like that. The top part of the form asks you, you know, what subject is this? So this does give you a report on the subjects that are most popular. What's your course name, textbook? What, where in the textbook are you? And then your question topic. So I think that's where, but based on your question topic, that it does a search on the database right at the time of submission. I'm not certain, though. Um, and then so not only what is your question, but also what steps have you taken and where are you having difficulty? So it really tries to elicit a lot of information from the students so that the answer can be as precise as possible. And on the back end, then, I can get a similar kind of report where it shows me um, who submitted the question. It does tell me what subject the question was in, the tutor that responded, how long did it take um, for the response to, to be given. Yes? Only what the student gives you. There's no sort of additional information. Right. Right. Well, this is different from Khan Academy in that there's no exercises or anything that's associated with the platform. It's purely a platform where tutoring occurs. Yeah, no, it's it's all based on what the what the student volunteers. Um, and so then the writing, the e-writing lab looks like this. There's um, it tells you, it asks you right at the beginning whether this is a new writing assignment or a follow-up draft. And again, you have archives, so you can look at what you've submitted before and what what they, what um, feedback you got. But um, then. So yeah, the, the writing right now is also asynchronous. They've talked about adding synchronous writing as another part of the synchronous service, but they haven't done that yet. But it, it's something that they've been talking a lot about. I think in the next year they'll start doing that as well. They meaning the consortium. So yeah, so again, the way the, there's the Connecticut Distance Learning Consortium, which contracts with Charter Oak State College, which is in Connecticut, I believe. So Charter Oak has a team of people that runs this platform. So there is a help system and a, and a help ticket system that if, if I notice that something's not working right in the system, I can go directly to them and say, this doesn't seem like it's working and they'll fix it. If students can't figure something out, they get help directly from them. But then at the consortium level, you know, a decision about doing synchronous writing isn't something that CTDLC would get involved with, that would be something that the North, the Northwest, which is now the Western eTutoring Consortium would decide, let's do synchronous writing, and then they would train tutors on the synchronous platform to do synchronous writing, and we would just start doing it. Right. Through that, through that team at CTDLC, yeah. And I found them pretty responsive. I think they make that available at the consortial level. So there's one person who's full-time executive director of the consortium, and she would have insight into that. I don't think that we as a just a member of a consortium have, have access to. But I can tell you that there have been times like when I've done the batch upload and things fail, and I'm like, that shouldn't fail. I can get them to fix it within a day just through direct interaction with them. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's it's a good question. So, I mean, first level is that to become a tutor here, you have to, as a consortium member, you're responsible for for providing tutors that are already trained locally at your institution. 
Um, so there's a certain level of trust as there would be in most any kind of consortial model that your partner is trustworthy and doing the right thing. And, and, and then there's a second level of training, whether if they're doing writing tutoring or whether they're doing synchronous tutoring, that once a, an institution says, here's the tutors that we have that are going to be participating, then there's a, another layer of training that at the writing level is a lot about making sure they understand the kinds of feedback and pedagogy that's expected. At the synchronous tutoring level, it's much more about using the tools and making sure that you're using them to the full extent, using audio, you understand how you use the whiteboard and, and so on, much less about how do you actually have conversations with students and elicit you know, appropriate levels of, of input so that you can give appropriate kinds of feedback without solving the problems for them and all that kind of thing. It's kind of assumed that, that, that they would be coming with that already. But again, there is also a quality assurance layer. So there are um, quality assurance people in the consortium as well as the executive director who are reviewing the feedback and the answers that are given all the time and providing that feedback to the tutors. So if they, if they find a problem, they'll coordinate them with the tutoring center person back at that institution where that tutor's from to try to figure out what's going on with that particular tutor. Um, so again, just lots of information. When you submit a paper, you're not just submitting a paper, you're submitting a lot about the assignment, what kinds of things you have questions about, what kinds of feedback you're looking for. And so I know you can't read this, you're not supposed to, but this is where our writing center director looked at this. This is an example of what the consortium provides. And she said, wow, because this is just the initial sort of feedback that students receive with the paper, which is also, I'll show you in a second, integrated with comments. So she's like, wow, a page and a half that's just sort of narrative, single space description. That's too much for students. They wouldn't, need, they wouldn't get all that. And then the paper itself, I don't know how well you can see, but there's lots of bold that's inserted. That's kind of the, the method. And so there's, there's more bold than non-bold in here. So the non-bold is the original student writing. The bold is the feedback. Again, our writing center director just felt like this is way too much. Our students wouldn't really respond that way. That's not how we would, that's not how we would go about doing it. So our writing, homegrown writing online support that's um, starting up is actually all um, video-based. So the, the writing center tutors will basically just talk through things and they feel like that'll be much more effective and I'm, I think it's a really good way to go. We've had very positive feedback. Yeah. We do use turn it in. Uh -huh. so they won't. <laughs> no. Our, our writing center folks are actually kind of anti turn it in. Um, so they definitely wouldn't. I mean, and I don't think they ever would unless they would have to coordinate with the instructors of the class because I think they would see that as an instructional decision, not a tutoring decision. Yeah, so we provide, we provide tutors to the consortium that are already trained and doing tutoring through our tutoring center. So, well, you mean they are tutors? Right, if we had, so we had didn't provide writing tutors because we kind of, op we told them we're not really going to be sending students to your writing tutoring, so we're not going to provide writing tutors either. So we provided tutors for synchronous subject areas, but we didn't provide any writing tutors. Yep. Yes, absolutely. We just didn't really promote it, yeah. So yeah, some interesting results around that I'll show you in a minute. So, so here's what the back end of the writing tutoring feedback looks like. It tells you, again, who submitted the writing, when did they submit it, who responded, how long was it in the queue. And um, you'll see right here this little ESL designation. So it does, the system does ask students whether English is their first language or not. And it turns out that not promoting the writing service resulted in almost all the students that have accessed the online writing service have been ESL students. And talking more with our writing center folks, they recognize that the, the methodology that our writing center uses to support ESL students isn't necessarily what ES, ESL students are looking for. So that might be one of those kind of decision points. If you're an ESL student and you're looking for tons of feedback on your grammar and that kind of thing, it's not really what the writing center will do. But if you ask these guys for that kind of feedback, they will give it. 
So interesting that our ESL students have really sort of figured that out and, and have made advantage, taken advantage of that. So again, just on the back end, the reporting mechanisms, um, you can get kind of a summary report of what um, e-questions are, uh, what, what subjects are being asked in the e-question, what the, av what the length of time people are um, using up the e-chat, and how many people are in e-writing. So there's, there's, again, a lot of reporting tools. A lot of it's pretty good. Some of it could be a little bit um, strengthened. And blah, blah, blah. Oh, and so then also part of what is built into the platform is after every student is done with their e-tutoring interaction, the system will send them an email saying, here's a quick follow-up survey. All they're asked is on a helpfulness scale of one to four, how helpful was it, and do you have any open-ended feedback? That's all there is to it. Yep, yep. Right, that's for the spring. Yep. Yep, for for the, the asynchronous e questions. Yeah. For the yeah. So so yeah, I'll show you more data that's easier to read in a minute on this stuff. So we get that feedback if students take that um, survey, we, we know how our students are feeling about the, the helpfulness of this. And so, okay, let me just back up and give you now a few more kind of details about costs and things. So the Western e Tutoring Consortium, you pay a $3,000 annual fee, and the first time you join, there's a $1,000 startup fee. And you provide, uh, you commit to providing as an institution 250 annual tutoring hours. That's um, 50 weeks of five hours a week. So for us, we pay our tutors 11 bucks an hour, so that comes out to like 27.50 a year. Um, what you get in return for that is 600 tutoring sessions. So they don't measure time, they measure in terms of sessions. So a, a writing paper carries the same weight as an online chat session that lasts longer than 10 minutes, carries the same weight as a, an asynchronously submitted question. And that's either parceled out in terms of semesters, 200 times three, or quarters, 150 times four. Um, if you exceed that quota, which we did this spring, we went past 200 for the spring semester, then you will add $500 to your next annual fee, but then you also have to double your tutoring hours. So the one thing that, um, the downside of that model is it doesn't scale to a really high level very well. So Pasadena City College, was very interested in this because they were using smart thinking and paying tens and tens of thousands of dollars to smart thinking. Um, when they started looking at Western E-Tutoring Consortium though, they realized that they were already using smart thinking at such a high level that they would have, that under this model, um, they would have to provide so many tutoring hours that um, in the process of telling smart thinking, you know, we're looking at this consortium, they got smart thinking to cut their price in about half. And it came down to almost the same level. So I think the consortium might need to rethink how they scale this way, way up. But it also then provided them a bargaining chip with smart thinking as well. And they ended up deciding to stay with smart thinking in the end because smart thinking does provide 24-7 and a little bit broader services once that, once that dollar amount came pretty close. But I think for most of us that don't have that level of usage, um, this is a, a quite a good deal. Yep. Uh-huh. Well, so once a tutor is in the system, they may be um, they may be dedicated to spending time in synchronous, or they can have some time where they're assigned by the coordinator of the of the consortium that you're just an answering asynchronous questions. I think um, they tell the synchronous tutors that if no one's in your room, you can go to the asynchronous queue and for your subjects and pull things off. But I think they do assign people to those queues dedicated to. So that's all something that the consortium coordinates. You don't really have to worry about that locally. We, I don't know, we do two tutors for two and a half a week. I think a lot of institutions just do a single tutor for five hours a week. I think it's really up to you how you decide to fulfill that commitment at your end. Yep. Do 
I doubt it, but well, I. I don't know. That's that's outside my daily work because I'm not a tutoring center person, so I don't know that. <laughs> yes. Right. So that's why I was saying this is 11 bucks an hour. So that would be 27.50 a year when you do that calculation. Right. So. Good question. Exactly. Right. So when you sign up, the the there's kind of a negotiation. So the coordinator will say, "It'd be great if you could provide us tutors in these subjects," and you might say, "You know, our tutors are really good at these subjects," and they might say, "Okay," or they might say, "Can you really try again to find someone else that can do that?" So there's just this kind of negotiation that happens. Um, these are all uh, permanent part-time employees, is my understanding. Yeah, that's how our tutoring center is set up. They're not students, no. Yeah, they're not faculty. They're not adjuncts. They're most of them are um, recent college graduates who are just either like they're in a master's program and they're just working part-time to provide the service. I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Okay, so I want to tell you just a little bit more about our process of making the decision here and, and some of the nitty gritty and some of the implementation, just so you have an idea about that. Um, again, back to where I started. I was new. I saw this was a need from the accreditation point of view. We had a director who had tried some things out and seeking ideas. We had administrators who were had these accreditation concerns. And I went to a conference presentation right here in Long Beach last spring, the ITC eLearning Conference, where I learned about eTutoring. And I just thought, wow, I'd never heard of that. That sounds like a great fit for us. And so we kind of ran with it. That's, that's how this sort of came about. We didn't really have to go through a governance process or get it approved by um, any particular person. It was really just a, an opportunity to pilot this. Um, so we did a survey last spring. I ran a survey of students that had taken at least one online class um, and asked them some questions specifically about online tutoring. Um, and it was very clear, 76% 70 said online tutoring would be appealing for classes that they're taking on campus, not just online classes. Um, and they liked having both the live option for interactive tutoring as well as an asynchronous option. Um, this was a, kind of an interesting one. It's important to me that online tutors are Maricosta employees rather than tutors from an outside private tutoring service. 55% said, yeah, but I don't know whether that was really kind of just sounded like a good idea, not necessarily a strong preference. Um, so another question we asked was, when would you access? So we gave them these options. Let just sort of look at that list and predict what you think would be the, the time that would be most important to students as as when they think they would access an online tutoring service. Okay, so here is here are the responses of how many what percentages said they would likely access at that time. Yeah, so Howard was right with the the dinner time. I mean, I wouldn't really have expected that Monday through Friday at dinner time was the most. And the middle of the night was the lowest. But, you know, this isn't a huge range. This is, this is a lot of people saying they would like to access it, you know, just about any time of the week, really. I mean, half, close to half the people said likely for almost all of the times. Okay, so then another question was which subject, subjects interest you? What do you think would be the highest on that list? Most people say math, and yeah, math was the highest. But you know, there's not a not a big difference in the distribution once you jump below math. They're all kind of in the one fifth to one third range. So again, that just tells you that students want uh, some students, a significant population of students want tutoring in a lot of different subjects. 
So, you know, the sort of the, the homegrown model where let's pick one or two subjects and offer it online, to me, then you're, you're missing a lot of people that might like other subjects. So again, I had discussions with the task director. We had um, a student success committee that had basic skills initiative grant funding that they were doing internally. So we were able to get this up and running without spending anything out of our own budgets because that committee granted us the startup funds that we needed. So we were able to get on board right away. And then I had discussions with those other tutoring center directors. And again, I would say, if you do something similar, have that sooner. <laughs> I did it too late in the process. So getting off the ground, the things, the, the, the steps, um, after you join the consortium, there's an initial setup process where the e-tutoring folks set up your login page and they give you the direct URL to that. And you've got to figure out how are we going to get that to our students. So you've got to put it on your website somewhere. We set up that whole uh, couple web pages with kind of information for students about online tutoring and its relationship to our other tutoring services. And then you've got to figure out who your tutors are going to be and make sure that they get trained because the, the consortium won't actually enable access to your students until you've given them the tutors and your tutors have completed their training and are scheduled to begin working. So that can be a little bit of a holdup if you're trying to get started up and your tutors that you've selected kind of dilly-dally and getting going, they've really got to get up there and get, get trained so that they flip that switch and it becomes available to your students. The other thing that you have to do is upload your all your students into the e-tutoring system. So we had to set up an extract from our student information system that was set up correctly, and then you've got to make sure that upload works. And there's always there's always been a few glitches with email addresses that their system doesn't like that are actually legitimate that I have to get them to accept. There's some weird things like if your students actually were previously part of the e-tutoring system through another institution, it won't reload them if they're using the same email address kind of bizarre to me, but it won't. So you have a few little things like that to just expect those hiccups when you um, start loading your students into their system. We did. Did you guys upload all your students all, to campus? All. Yep. Uh, we just did a softball launch. So we didn't do a lot of publicity. We just kind of wanted to see how it went without making a big, huge splash about it right out of the gate. So we did a little bit of publicity. We targeted a few faculty members to let students know about it. The tutoring centers themselves had some, some little flyers that they put out and they might inform students if it seemed like a good fit for them. But we kept it pretty low key for the fall just to kind of let things work out and then we monitored how things went. Yes? Well, so our, we actually have two official LMSs that we support. Oh! Consortium doesn't have an LMS. They, it's just a homegrown platform. Adobe Connect is the synchronous platform, but everything else is just kind of homegrown web page stuff. Um, they, so they, we do, um, we wanted them to do Shibboleth, because that's what we're doing for single sign-on, and they don't support that yet. So they do have a way of integrating with your course management system, and I can't remember what it is, but it wasn't something that we wanted to mess with with them. We wanted to wait for them to have a shibboleth up. So they do have a single sign-on, but I, off the top of my head, I don't remember what it is. I, I don't remember. Sorry. So we, we built this web page, got students to come in. Um, Oh, that's also part of the web page is just a screenshot that shows what's available to students, gives them a little information about how to use the system. Um, I used to have to screenshot the weekly schedule and add it to our website, but they've built it now so that it just feeds into our website, so that's really nice. So second semester this spring, we've, we had enough success indicators from the fall that we, um, that we expanded our publicity this spring. And the biggest thing that I think made a difference this spring was linking from our course management system. So we have links. We have kind of an, an announcement that's always close to the top of the list in the announcements in our course management system. And that, that has really led to a big jump in usage. So here's what the e-tutoring usage by week throughout the year looked like. This is winter break right here. Here's Thanksgiving. Here's spring break. We had a, an article in the Mirror Coast, which is a campus-wide newsletter that was really our only spike in the, in the fall. Right here is where we added e-tutoring to our course management systems, and that, that really led it, you know, to, to take off. So, um, 
just just this year. Yep. So again, here's here's how our e-tutoring usage of those three different services compares to the consortium wide. Consortium wide, the writing is by far the most used service because we've really downplayed it. It's our least used service. Um, but the ESL popularity kind of jumped from fall to spring and that led it to kind of get caught up as a proportion of our usage with the e-question. For us, the e-chat, though, is the one that's really very popular. Yeah, that's just on our on our public site. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, but then to actually log in, you have to go to the etutoring.org site and then log in. Yes, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Yes. No, so that's that's really one of my takeaways that I want to leave you with. Um, so, just popular e-question subjects, um, math and chemistry were in the top two, but. As was noted, these numbers are pretty low for individual subjects. What I want to note here, though, is just as the service has grown, the number of different subjects that people use at least somewhat on the e-questions is expanding. What I really don't know and would love to know is what the subject usage is for the e-chat, the synchronous service. Does it mirror this or is it different? Don't know. Um, our helpfulness students think it's about as helpful as the consortium wide. Um, and then I have. I have a bunch of open-ended responses on here that I don't have time to show you, but my PowerPoint's up on the portal. So if you're interested in hearing and seeing what our students individually are saying as well as our tutors, I would encourage you to look at it. I'm going to skip all this text and get to my last thing, which speaks to that last question, um, next steps for us. So as I've mentioned, I think more delineation and guidance. We've learned enough about what seems to work well for students. and with the online tutoring that we'd like to kind of begin to, to help to guide students. When does it make sense to use online tutoring? When does it make sense to say, that's probably not your best option, come to campus? Um, we want to increase publicity and especially reach out to faculty. Because right now it's been like there's been emails that have gone out to faculty. But for the most part, this has been student initiatives. Students have figured it out, shared it by word of mouth. We've had a few faculty um, who have who've really gotten excited about it. The jump in accounting usage from fall to spring, I think was based on a couple of counting faculty members that really pushed their students to use the service. But we want to find out more about faculty. And what I would love to do to research this is to start saying, let's identify a faculty member for a course that really pushes this and another one that doesn't, and see if, that, if we see some differences in outcomes based on that. Um, there's also the question of supplemental online tutoring. So there's a company here at this conference called Link Systems that's trying to get in with us and with e-tutoring the platform to say, you know, if this isn't quite enough, if there's additional subjects or additional times that you need coverage, we'll come in and provide that within your overall structure. So that's just something we'll keep an eye on. I don't think it's a big need for us right now, but it is a, a possibility to kind of have the best, best of both worlds, where you could have consortium, but if consortium isn't quite enough, you could add that. And then just keep on monitoring our usage and satisfaction. So we're out of time. Um, definitely feel free to follow up with me here at the conference over the next couple of days. You can contact me and I'm happy to, to discuss further with you offline as well. Thanks for your time today.